Welcome to the underground, the Steel City Underground, the black and gold standard for Pittsburgh Steelers coverage. Now, here are your hosts, Brian E. Roach and Christina Rivers. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Steel City Underground podcast, uh, brought to you in part by mybookie.ag. Uh, remember, it's as important who you place your bets with as it is who you place your bets on. Uh, today, we have a special edition of the podcast. Uh, we're going to be uh, joined by a couple guests, one of whom is a frequent uh, Steel City Underground contributor uh, and uh, editor extraordinaire, Christina Rivers. Christina, how are you today? I'm doing good in this uh, hostile, negative 40 degree below wind chills. Yes, Tina's out in Iowa, and uh, it's very snowy there, and I, I repeatedly told her I'm very jealous of the snow because I, while I am the host who doesn't like toast, I like snow. You can have all of it. I'll send it to you. <laughs> all right, and uh, along with Tina, uh, our special guest today uh, is the author of a, a new book um, called uh, Starless. It's about the 1947 uh, Pittsburgh Steelers team. Uh, his name is Steve Massey. Steve, welcome aboard the podcast. Uh, thanks for having me. It's a real treat to be here, and I appreciate it. Steve, I, I know I wanted to thank you for um, letting me read the book. I know it's the story of Pittsburgh's first NFL playoff team. And in the book's bio, you said they were an unlikely set of no-name brawlers who came together to make a championship run. When tragedy intervened and the stars fell, it would be another 25 years before the Steelers were in the playoffs again. Now, for our listeners, could you just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. Um, I grew up in Mississippi. Uh, I'm not a native of Pennsylvania. I'm a southerner. And um, from an early age, I latched on with the Steelers from those wonderful uh, Noel era teams and just kind of stayed with them. And uh, it really struck a chord with me. I'm a fan to this day. Um, I grew up in Mississippi. I graduated from the University of Southern Mississippi in uh, 1994 after a, a time in the Air Force. Uh, and then I moved here to Georgia about 20 years ago. And um, the Starless team is, uh, is really one of my favorite Steelers teams. Now, before we get started talking about the book, you use a couple of unique words. One of them is steel lore. So it's S-T-E-E-L-O-R-E. -E. And the second one was paleo NFL. Can you explain those two terms? Sure. Uh, I, I coined the phrase steel lore uh, when talking about the, the old Steeler tales that have been passed down uh, that a lot of uh, Steeler fans know about. And some of them are true, and some of them are half true, and some of them are nonsense. Um, you know, Johnny Blood is an example of one of the Steelers that played. And there's all kinds of tales about him, and there's a, a lot of tales about the Rooney family. Um, so it's, it's just a, a sort of a list of all of these stories that have been passed down through the years. As far as paleo goes, um, I kind of use that term for really anything that happened in the NFL uh, before 1960. Um, it, it was just a different time. It was a very rough and brutal sport then. Uh, in a lot of ways, it was more visceral then than it is now. So uh, I kind of think of those guys as, as being back from a, a different age. Well, and I think Brian and I talked a little, little bit about that, about um, how the guys that played, a lot of them played both directions and multiple positions. Absolutely. Uh, and that was uh, why the impact of some of these people was so tremendous. Uh, Chuck Cherandulo played both ways uh, in the line. Um, and, of course, Bill Dudley, who was not on the Starless team, um, he was a complete all-star in 1946. He won the MVP award. Um, he led the NFL in interceptions that year. He had 10 of them um, in, a, um, in an 11-game season. Um, and so he had to make it both ways, and he played in a lot of pain on the 46 team. That's just one example. Sid Luckman, that played for the Bears, is one of the greatest two-way athletes of the World War II era in the NFL. Speaking of World War II, your book goes into a lot of detail about how the war 
affected um, the players in the NFL. Could you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. Uh, World War II was uh, was such a, a diluvial event for the NFL because uh, the, the teams, the, the older players were purged from the rosters, and when they all started coming back in 1945 and 1946, um, the players' attitudes had changed, the things that they'd been through had changed, um, and the league had been held together uh, by several factors. Uh, but when the war was over and the guys came home, it was like a fresh start. That was one of the things that was so promising about the Steelers was that before the war, uh, they had really struck on the field for the most part. Uh, and then once the war was over and the players came back, the Steelers had a clean slate. Um, and during the war, of course, the NFL had a lot of different things going. The Cleveland Rams suspended operations. The Steelers merged twice. Uh, and the personnel, the quality of the play uh, suffered, of course, because a lot of the guys went overseas to fight in the war. Now, in your book, I, I thought it was interesting. Uh, in today's modern NFL, they have a 53-man roster, but they had, what was it, 20 less guys on the roster or, as far as dressing per game? Yeah, that's that's correct. Um, they, they actually had pared the rosters down to even smaller levels during the war, and I don't want to linger about that too much. Um, but, you know, the NFL, uh, there was a time when it looked like the NFL might die completely uh, before uh, FDR issued what was called the green light letter, saying that sports would be good for the morale of the people. So the rosters had gotten to skeleton levels, and they bounced up to uh, – 34 or 35 players uh, in the post-World War II uh, era. Uh, and, you know, so the, it, going both ways was, uh, it had to be done. Now, I want to jump just a, just a little bit because we really want to focus on the meat of, of your book, which is, you know, your book leads up to the 1947 season and then really highlights the 1947 team. And, one of the biggest stories uh, that caught my attention was training camp at Camden Springs, Pennsylvania. Can you tell tell the listeners a little bit about the information there? Just give them a teaser because I, I found that part very interesting. Yes, uh, it was very old school. Uh, the, the coach was uh, Jock Sutherland. Um, he was actually a dentist. Uh, so he ran a really tight ship and there were a number of characters there in the camp that were extremely interesting. One of them, uh, that comes to my mind is, uh, Buck Sweeney and Buck Sweeney was this old cop. He had retired from the police force and he just liked hanging out, uh, where the Steelers were. And so the Rooney's got to know him and they hired him. Well, Doc Sweeney and, um, his, uh, assistant, uh, Jack Lee uh, were instructed by Coach Sutherland to put uh, oatmeal in the drinking water uh, because they wanted the players to be tough. And, you know, back then the coaches didn't have any idea about hydration, um, and I'm not sure they would have cared anyway. So it just discour it discouraged the players from drinking the stuff. And what, what they would do, and all the players remembered this to a man, uh, the oatmeal in the water, what these guys would do is they'd go over and try to get the ice and, and suck the coolness out of it. And uh, Art Rooney Jr., who was assigned to be a water boy, um, had to keep this stuff mixed up, and he had to stay between the players and the stuff. And one day he he knocked the stuff over, and it covered the players, uh, much to their disgust. <laughs> <laughs> Camp, camp was pretty regimented, uh, and, and again, steel ore comes into play because there, there's a lot of stories about guys trying to sneak out of camp. It's a little bit hard for me to believe that because these guys had, you know, a lot of them had been in the war. There, there were some combat veterans on the team, so I'm thinking they probably could have made it through an NFL camp after what they'd seen. Um, but got, players came in and out of camp. Uh, I know there was one of the Rooney's it was a family friend. They let him into camp. He didn't last very long. Now I heard, I, I saw the reference to Puka Cola. So that must've been the oatmeal in the water. 
Absolutely. Uh, and it's, you know, what I, what I learned about the team when I researched the book uh, was that they all said that it was like drinking puke. Uh, so they all quickly learned not to drink the stuff if they could avoid it. I, I read that and I had a laugh out loud moment. Yeah, it was pretty funny when, when I was researching it. And, uh, I, you know, I think it's, it's really neat because I have this picture of, of, uh, Doc Sweeney and his assistant Jack wandering all over this hill that was above the, the uh, practice field, making sure that that oatmeal was still in there. Uh, and poor Art Jr. was assigned the task of keeping these big guys away from it. Um, but that, like I said, they oh, all run into a man. Oh, that's awful. Now, I know I, Brian wants to know who Big Bertha is. Uh, yeah, that Big Bertha was pretty much the only lady that was in camp and what she was, was this great big monstrous blocking sled uh that these guys had and uh, i think it was kind of a medieval contraption uh because it was pretty impossible to move uh and the guys would have to go push that thing around uh the, the nfl was just so different than in in uh it's a violent and fast game now uh, but there was, I think there was something more personal about it back then. And so, you know, I'm sure every team had these horrible blocking contraptions that they had to move around. They all hated Big Bertha to no end. Now, the, probably the biggest story in your book is the, I don't know whether the word feud is the correct word, but the relationship between Jock Sutherland and Bullet Bill Dudley, if you want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, and actually, when I first learned about the the Steel, the 47 Steelers when I was a boy, uh, that was really the story that kind of got my attention the most uh, because Bullet Bill was just – he's just this tremendous figure. Um, he he plays both ways. He's a, he's a superstar at both of them. He's a real team guy. He had, he had played on the 42 team that uh, Walt Kiesling – Coast, and he was such an encouragement and a leader to the other players. But Jock, the coach, Jock Sullivan was not wired that way. He thought that Bill was a prima donna. And, you know, Bill kind of took creative liberties inside of um, Jock's offense. Now, this is in the 46 preseason. So Dudley doesn't have the big, the big year yet. And one day things come to an end, come to a head between the two of them, when there's this long three-hour practice that they go through. Jock's practices were marathon. And Bill got frustrated, and he basically had a confrontation with two of the assistant coaches, um, uh, John Michelosin and Mike Nixon. And uh, Jock comes in, and he puts a stop to him. Um, and at that point, there's just a divide between the two guys that gets worse as the season goes on. And as far as the individual incident, uh, Bill went to apologize to Jock because he realized he'd been in the wrong, and he was. And Jock didn't let him get a word in in the office. And uh, things just went sour. They went downhill from there. So then, um, so the story of, of Bill Dudley kind of ends in Pittsburgh. He gets uh, he gets traded to the Lions. Now, Bill Bill was ready to retire. He he'd had enough football. Uh, you know, he he just didn't want to play anymore if he was going to be subjected to what he felt like was just brutal treatment. And so he's going to retire, but then he he doesn't. And the reason that he doesn't do this is that so the Roonies can trade him to the Lions and get something for him. Uh, and so they do trade him to Detroit, um, and you know they they come out the Steelers come out pretty well on the deal. Um, so that was his exit. Um, but they, you know they couldn't have known what was coming. The Steelers fans were, uh, I'm sure, a bit perplexed um, because the this uh, feud between uh, Jock and Bill was kept private, and suddenly they have this MVP and they trade him to the Lions. Um, but I don't think the city had any idea uh, the good fortune that was about to head their way in 1947. Okay, let's. You know, I want to jump ahead because the 1947 team uh, in your book, you talk about that they had 11 rookies that year. 
how did they take 11 rookies and put them with the players that they had remaining and actually make it to the playoffs? Well, there are, there are actually a couple of things in play. First of all, uh, the first thing is that the slate had sort of been wiped clean from World War II. So there were a lot of younger players in the NFL then. Uh, and part of that is because there's a new football league called the AAFC. I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but it was a rival league and it was a quality league. It had the Cleveland Browns in it, for example. And so uh, a lot of the, the talent was, was stretched out over both leagues. And the Steelers had three guys that came back, uh, and the most important one was um, Chuck Cherandulo, and he was a great leader. Uh, and the team gelled. Uh, they, they brought in a lot of good talent that year. Uh, the Lions trade was good uh, because they got uh, uh, White and they got uh, Bob Stiffers in that trade. Uh, so, you know, I, I just think that they were a young team, but I think all of in the NFL were young at that point, except for the Bears. At what game during the 1947 season do you think stands out the most in Steelers lore or, or Steel lore or Steelers history? Well, there were, there were so many big games, it's, it's hard to decide. The funny thing is that, you know, one of the great Steelers books that I have is uh, Ray Didiger's book that came out in 73. And he listed the top five games in Steelers history. And one of them was a loss uh, where they played the Redskins. And, and that game had seven lead changes. And it was a loss, but it showed the Steelers uh, what they were capable of doing, you know, that they were capable of hanging with the best teams in the NFL. So that's one. The first Philadelphia game where they came back uh, and they won that game with a, a late comeback rally. That was exciting. Um, it's, it's just it's so hard to single one out uh, against the Giants. They scored three touchdowns in less than two minutes. Um, I, if I had to pick one, I would say it was the Green Bay game. Uh, they went up there to Wisconsin and uh, they'd never beaten the Packers before and they beat them by one point. Um, and that was a real big deal for the guys. And speaking of big deals, not to cut you off, uh, Steve, but <clears throat> You know, there's a big deal going on uh, uh, soon uh, with a big game, and, and a lot of people like to do this crazy thing called betting on these games with, uh, you know, taking their money and putting it out there and hoping that they can uh, win some money. And I'm sure that uh, there's a lot of people out there that plan on betting on this game uh, coming up. And one of the things about betting on anything is it's just as important who you're betting on as it is who you're betting with. And, and that's why we'd like to talk about mybookie.ag. They've been in business for a lot of years. They have a rock solid reputation and they do big cash bonuses that allow you to basically start off ahead of the game. You're making money for doing nothing at all. They also have the fastest payouts in the business, just two business days. Now, mybookie is a premier destination for props as well. These guys truly let you bet on anything, whether it's the length of the national anthem or the color of the sports drink being dumped on the winning coach. MyBookie has a buffet of props for the big game, all for you to place your money on. And they'll even let you uh, live bet the game itself. So, you know, when we talk about services like this, we only recommend services that have been good to us. And that's why we like to make sure that we talk about MyBookie.ag. If you join now, my bookie will match your deposit with a 50% bonus. Just use the promo code SteelCity uh, to get that when you activate it. And go ahead and visit mybookie.ag today. You play, you win, and you get paid. Tina, why don't you continue with Steve? Now, when I was re reading the book, uh, you go, you know, in the 47 section of the book, you go game by game and really went into detail about the things that happened. And uh, one thing that I noticed about it was the amount of tur turnovers and injuries and how they impacted the games. Absolutely. The opener against um, Detroit, um, I, you know, I can't recall the specific number of turnovers from both teams, but um, I think it was 10, you know, nine or 10 uh, that swung the momentum. Um, I think, 
the injuries. Now, I tell you, it's it's really interesting. Let me back up for just a minute because at the beginning of the year, the Steelers' secondary was pretty awful. And by the end of it, they got to be very dangerous. Um, there were a lot of big interception returns in those games. The injuries, they would just send those guys back out there. Uh, toward the end of the year, Chuck Cherandolo uh, was had a rib broken. And he didn't even know about it until the end of the game. He'd broken his rib in his first in the first quarter. Um, so I mean, those those stories are all throughout the whole season, and I tried to detail them in the book. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about, just, and it, we don't have to go into a lot of detail, but I found this really fascinating about Jock Sutherland. He really believed wholeheartedly in the single wing offense. And you said in the book he was credited by some as creating the Packer sweep. And for some of our old old time diehard Steelers fans, can you talk a little bit about Jock's uh, decision that he was going to stick with that single wing formation? Yes, um, Jock Jock ran the single wing really to perfection. And when you first learn about the single wing, one of the things that I think is falsely conveyed a lot of times is that the single wing is a simple offense. It's not. Uh, the center has to snap the ball to three or four different people. There are a number of fakes in it. The, the, I think the most important part of the single wing is the pulling guards in the center. Um, but Jot stayed with that despite the fact that the T formation was what just about everybody used. Uh, in the NFL because it had become this revolutionary formation with the new forward passing and so forth. But Jock just really ran that thing to perfection. Um, now, Lombardi played for Fordham, uh, the Fordham University Rams, the University of Fordham, um, and they had gone up against a couple of Jock's teams, and Lombardi remembered that way later uh, when he uh, became the coach of the Packers in the early 60s. And he, the part of the Lombardi sweep uh, that he would just run over and over until he got a couple of touchdowns uh, was designed from playing against Sutherland's teams. So, so Lombardi basically stole Jock's scheme. <laughs> well, you know, I don't, I don't think he stole it. I just I think it was a big part of what he was doing uh, because, you know, he was down on that field and he had to deal with those pulling blockers coming. And when the ball's been snapped to God knows who and faked a couple of times, uh, if you're not careful about what's in front of you, somebody's going to run your butt over. And, you know, I think that Lombardi was smart enough to incorporate that into his running game. So it was a uh, flattery by imitation. I think so. Yeah. I think that's a pretty good description. Okay. I wanted to talk just a couple more things. One of the things too, that I noticed is that after the tragedy of losing Sutherland, and you can talk a little bit about that. Um, I noticed that some of the people that he brought in, uh, like Pat Livingston, that that started kind of a culture then in these professional football teams, uh, like uh, Pat Livingston bringing in uh, Ray Byrne, and then uh, John Mickelson discovering Mike Ditka and Marty Schottenheimer. So could you go back and talk a little bit about Jock and how his loss affected the team, and then maybe a little bit about how that created kind of a coaching tree that went on and created a legacy in the pro football? Absolutely. Uh, Jock, Jock's death was so unexpected and so quick. Uh, the, the Rooney family felt that, you know, the Steelers were going to win championships from his coaching. And that's not, to me, that's not at all far fetched. Um, they found him wandering around right after the 47 season ended. They found him in Kentucky. He had been down there visiting, uh, some coaching friends of his down in the South. He did it every Easter. But he disappeared and his sister was looking for him uh, and they found him. They brought him home to Pittsburgh. Uh, his his number, his right hand man, Michael Oson, uh, was there to bring him home. They got him to the hospital and he died two or three days later. Um, so it was just such an unexpected blow. 
uh, uh, as, as far as the impact that he had, um, there were so many of those guys uh, that ended up uh, with long coaching careers in high school uh, and some, some in the pros. Uh, and they, in turn, influenced other people. Um, and it does carry down to uh, Mike Ditka eventually, Marty Schottenheimer. And by the way, you know, all the Steelers fans know Schottenheimer influenced Cower too. So, uh, you know, we're getting a little bit far from shore uh, as far as Sutherland goes, but that uh, the branches are there. They connect to the tree. So uh, and as far as the, the impact on the city, when Jock died, uh, it, it was really, it was gloomy when they buried him. You know, they lowered the flags to half staff. The mayor was there. The pallbearers were the Steelers players. Uh, it was just really a, a tragic thing for the city. And, and the, the team, you know, it affected the team for years after that because uh, they, they couldn't figure out which direction to go in until they brought in Buddy Parker. Well, and I just I want to tell readers, you know, this was it was a pleasure for me to read this. Yeah, I was born in 1972 which is the year that the Steelers finally made it back to the playoffs so some some of these names I recognize because I've been a Steelers fan my whole life but to actually read your book and uh, get into some of these details was it was not only entertaining but it, it really was interesting to me to see the difference between football then because you hear people talk about oh the football players of today never would have been able to survive in the league then and I know Brian wanted to talk about kind of the difference between um, modern day football versus uh, that time period so Brian I'll let you go ahead sure um, I mean and let me just start off by saying I, I I've, I've been able to peruse it a little bit but I look forward to uh, reading the book completely um, my daughter, who is a, a, a Steelers uh, aficionado too, I'm sure will love this book because uh, she loves the history and, and, as you said, the steel lore, uh, steel lore of the of the team. Um, what I find really interesting, though, about this, about your book, about the '47 team, and about the uh, kind of the aura around it is is it, it, with. The, the concept of it being a team without stars, so to speak, uh, and how that par parlays into what we're going through right now today. So, you know, do you see correlations between, you know, what they're calling, of course, the Steelers circus right now, where you've got uh, a culture that is so permissive and accepting, accepting of the star players doing whatever it is they want to do, uh, that ends up in a situation like we have with Antonio Brown versus what it was. And, and I've made this statement. In fact, I made it with Joe on, on a podcast earlier uh, where, you know, a team can actually be a better team without the distractions that, that sometimes come with better players. Um, and do you see any correlation between that 47 team and, and where we are now? Yeah. Um, actually, uh, I, I wouldn't mind talking about Antonio and Le'Veon as well. Um, you know, I, I watched a game earlier in the year uh, where Antonio was, uh, he was flipping out on the sidelines. And uh, he was going, you know, he was asking to have the ball thrown to him and so forth. He's a great athlete. He's a great receiver. Um, but as I watched that happen, the younger players sitting on the bench were literally watching everything go down quietly. They weren't talking amongst themselves. They were just watching it, watching it. And I think that sometimes teams have leaders, uh, but they don't, they're not necessarily negative or positive. And I felt like Antonio was sort of leading the team, uh, you know, in kind of a negative fashion. But Antonio is what he is. He's a great uh, skill player. He, he may be the best skills player to ever play for the Steelers, but it's the attitude that he that he has that I think can create problems. As far as Le'Veon goes, the reason I want to mention him is because my view about him is that he's got a talent. It's his talent. It's not ours. And if he wants to sell it to someone else, he's within his right to do that. 
it's so hard when times change. It's we try to judge things the way that people looked at sports in 1947 is very different from the way that they look at it now. I don't think Antonio could have played for Jock uh, or Chuck Knoll. Uh, but if Mike Tomlin can coach the team to success with Antonio, then he probably should. One of my favorite Steelers teams <clears throat> that played during my lifetime was the 84. And I don't know that it had uh, a superstar on it. Probably Donnie Shell. Uh, but he wasn't recognized a lot of the times back then. Uh, so sometimes things can be a lot more endearing than modern. Yeah, I think that's, that there, that's true. Um, it is, it's an interesting uh, dilemma that they find themselves in now. And I, I just, it, it, it struck me uh, where you had the conflict with Dudley and Sutherland and, and how that compares to where we sit now with A.B. and Mike Tomlin uh, and the team. And 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 just kind of that whole uh, that vibe felt very familiar, and it's funny how sometimes history can repeat itself in ways. Um, you know, I uh, just want to take a few moments to to thank you for joining us. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time, team. Definitely appreciate you coming on and spearheading this, uh, Steve. Uh, if you want to give everybody a shout out, tell them the name of the book again, how they can get it, or or when it's released if it's not yet released. Uh, and what they can do to to follow you or or con connect with you on social media if you have those types of accounts. You can follow me on Twitter at 1947 Steelers. You can come to the website at 1947steelers.com, or you can visit me on Facebook at 1947 Steelers. I really appreciate you guys having me on. Uh, I just I love Steelers. Can't get enough of them. And I just loved researching this book. Tina, just so everybody can, uh, not that you're not already followed by the entire universe, because you are, because you're just that brilliant. Uh, but let everybody know how they can follow you as well. I think you're exaggerating a little bit, but they can follow me on Twitter. And it's at the number three, Rivers, R-I-V-E-R-S, underscore writer, W-R-I-T-E-R. -E so at three, Rivers, underscore writer. All right, that's going to wrap it up for this edition of the Steel City Underground podcast. Uh, again, uh, thanks to Tina and Steve for joining us. Remember to pick up a copy of his book, uh, Starless, The 1947 Steelers on Amazon.com. And until the next time, my name's uh, Brian. Her name is Tina. His name is Steve. It's chaos out there, so be kind. We would like to thank you for listening and remind our listeners to follow us on social media and our website, www.steelcityunderground.com.